Welcome to an interview with part of a series of discussions with senior professionals across the risk and governance markets. My name is Rob Starkle, Managing Partner at the Risk Partners, and I am delighted today to be joined by Martin Botha. Uh, Martin's the Chief Risk Officer at Leading European Private Debt Manager, Pemberton Asset Management. Uh, he's got a wealth of experience uh, within the industry from the UK, Luxembourg, Saudi Arabia. Martin, thank you very much for joining us today. How are you? Thank you, Rob. It's it's a pleasure to join you. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, all is good. Thank you. How about you? Wonderful. Very well. Thank you. Really, really appreciate your time. I know that things are super busy at the moment with the various things that are going on in the world. Um, so really, really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Martin, very interested. I, I really like asking people about their journey and, and how they found their way into the wonderful world of risk management. How did you how did you start out in risk? Uh, actually, Rob, I grew up on a farm in South Africa, and during my sort of youth, I, I always wanted to become a vet because you're surrounded by the animals on the farm, and you sort of that seems to be the logical way. Uh, but at the same time, I also had big dreams, which, as you've seen, taken me in, in, on an international stage. Uh, so I realized sort of just before I started university that. Uh, the vet option is not going to give me that. Uh, so I basically ended up taking my second choice, which was a finance related uh, degree. Uh, so I, I studied commerce, uh, economics and econometrics at university. And I was sort of guided into risk management by my supervisor, Professor Paul Steiger, who's taken an interest in me. Uh, and initially I thought that becoming a prop trader was the way to go. And he sat me down and said, listen, there are two sides of this coin. I think your personality fits the risk management side better. Uh, really? And he said that to you even at an academic level, he said that? Absolutely, yeah. No, right. He was a very smart and kind man. Fantastic. So uh, no, so he guided me into uh, risk management and he actually was very instrumental in, in finding my first real job in risk management as well, which was at APSA Bank joining the Asset Liability Committee, right. uh, which I'm very gra grateful to him for. Fantastic. Because Fantastic. that's really interesting because others who I've spoken to, they kind of almost fall into risk. It's not necessarily something that they've been identified for to say, OK, this is this fits. But this sounds like it was really early for you. Indeed. I mean, I made a conscious decision to go into risk management. Uh, I know probably the biggest part of the risk professionals out there and sort of fell into it. And well, I'm glad to say I chose it. <laughs> But, but that, that's great because if that was something that you wanted to do and you've chosen it to, and taken that path, I guess you've almost been able to define your path. And, and, and I think I mentioned at the outset of the conversation, you, you, you've worked abroad as well in different places. So you've almost been kind of been able to prescript that and, and, and engineer that. I, I tried to at least, Rob. I mean, I, I had a, a sort of vision in your head for what you want to do. And then there's real life that uh, plays a part in that and sometimes luck and opportunity that that all influences the path that you that you end up going and and i'm very thankful because i i think i've been quite fortunate in my career in, in in the opportunities that was given to me but that's fantastic and again sort of one of the things that i think a lot of people that speak to me are saying that they've missed certainly throughout uh, the trickier times which will come on to my next question in a moment but um has been that ability to network and and develop those relationships which inevitably leads to those career decisions further down the line so um that's if you've been able to sort of use your network and go through that process i i, I guess that's been really powerful for you absolutely i mean it's building a uh sort of reputation as you as you go along in risk management and and I mean what you do how you do it and doing the right thing at least most of the time is, is the tools in which you build your relationships I mean risk management is not an easy topic sometimes for some people uh, but being consistent and trying to do the right thing is is, is the way that, that, that at least I, I've went by it absolutely absolutely well, that, I guess that, that does lead on quite nicely then. Um, obviously, we've seen some pretty strong headwinds in the world over the, the, the past few years. Trying to do the right thing, obviously, has been top of the agenda within that time, uh, doing the right thing for all of us to keep us all, all safe and well. Um, 
uh, how has the pandemic affected your team and, and your business down at Pemberton? I mean, the pandemic was interesting because different sectors of the market were affected differently. So from our investments perspective, obviously, there, there was some concern around the travel and hospitality sectors. Uh, but luckily, Pemberton had pretty low exposure to that. Uh, so from a credit perspective, those were our immediate concerns. Mm -hmm. But the pandemic also brought a lot of liquidity into the market and excess liquidity is normally good for, for credit. So all in all, I think Pemberton probably benefited slightly from from the pandemic relative to, to perhaps some of our competitors. Uh, we've done really well, I thought. Uh, from a team's perspective, uh, I actually think the pandemic helped slightly in that area as well, because we have offices obviously in different locations, London, Luxembourg, Paris, uh, we have offices in Germany and Italy as well. Yeah. Uh, and the ability to then join those offices together through remote working sort of broke down the barriers that previously existed with office working between these locations. Right. So suddenly we, we, we felt much more like a bigger Pemberton team versus the London team, Luxembourg team. Uh, <laughs> team in Munich and that's thing. That's that's really interesting you say that because a lot of people we've talked about the division that it's caused for, for the fact that you can't physically be in the office so that's actually quite an interesting take on it the fact that you're all working remotely therefore you're part of the same group that's really interesting. Yeah no I, I thought it worked really really well. Interesting interesting and, and I guess what about now we're sort of starting to see now in the market certain things that are starting to bite for example the thing in the news at the time of filming this of course is the the p o ferry situation that's that's unfolded where a business that has suffered quite significantly from the pandemic is obviously now feeling the bite of it are you seeing that as a business now or again are you still seeing taking advantage if you like of, of some of those situations uh, i think Going forward, Rob, the biggest concerns are, are some macroeconomic factors. I mean, it's like I said, the P&O ferry situation is once again a specific sector of the market that, that we're affected. They also fall within the travel and hospitality or sort of at least travel sector. Uh, so th those firms will continue to face some challenges. But I think this might be broader going forward. Obviously, the excess liquidity leads to inflation. Once you have inflation, there is an element of uh, tightening of monetary policy. So we expect central banks uh, throughout the world to, to increase interest rates. Uh, once you increase the interest rates, it makes borrowing more expensive for borrowers. And that in itself could have an effect on the credit that we need to be aware of. Uh, but like I said, it's it's the, the, the crux in this for, for a private debt manager is to make sure that you do your due diligence properly before the money goes out the door and make sure you position your fund correctly in the right sectors uh, to withstand some headwinds that that might come because you never know how the ukraine crisis unfolds uh, so you you position yourself as best as you can uh, of course and that's definitely what what we do at pemberton as well yeah of course and, and i think the, the uncertainty appears to continue you know if, if, if we'd had this conversation a few years ago and and, and looked down the track of a global pandemic uh, you know a, another war in Europe and you know, all of these other elements you know we probably would have laughed I mean it, it, it has been quite quite challenging here we are now chugging through 2022 are there any particular risks from your perspective that you see as the biggest challenge, the biggest risks to your business this year? You mentioned the macroeconomic scenario, of course. Yeah, yeah. So, so the macroeconomic one is probably the one that comes uh, sort of highest, I think, probably on my list. But also, Pemberton, like I said, was lucky through, during 2020, 2021. And in 2022, we have big plans as well. Uh, we're launching new businesses. Uh, new strategies. Uh, so I'm going to spend a big part of 2022 looking about sort of the systems and controls that's required for these new ventures that we're going into. Uh, I mean, we uh, 
we spend a lot of time on the investment risk elements of it, but uh, equally we spend significant of time on the operational risk side, making sure the uh, business applies good corporate governance, that we are on the right side of the regulations, uh, and that you do the things in an optimal way. I mean, systems, controls, processes, uh, the relationships you have with your fund administrators, uh, the all of those basically builds on a good relationship with your with your limited partners, your investors. Uh, so you have to bring all of these things together. I think that's one of the key challenges that from it, from when I've spoken to people has been finding that balance between the financial risk element and then the non financial risk part. It's it's where do you invest your time and your resources into keeping that balancing act? Um, Absolutely. Is there, I mean, how do you manage that? Is that is that kind of a uh, an open-ended discussion or, or do you, is there an approach that you, you tend to find to manage that? I think the simple answer to that one, Rob, is I, I, I try to do both of them as best as I can. Cool. Uh, and sometimes you get pulled in different directions depending on uh, where the immediate need is. Uh, and I get that it's very tempting to sometimes get spilled into the financial risk management thing, so at least side of it. But if you look at uh, historical mishaps that have caused firms to go under, the largest majority of those have been on the operational risk side where things have gone wrong operationally in the organization. Mm-hmm. I always say to, to my colleagues, you could potentially recover from a financial mishap. If the operational mishap is big, then your chances of recovery becomes much smaller because it normally leads to huge reputational uh, damage to your organization. Uh, so I, I, I make a conscious effort to always ensure that there's a thorough look at the systems, processes and controls that that's required to run a business. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess these events that we've mentioned have thoroughly tested the resilience of those systems. Absolutely, areas. absolutely. <laughs> There's nothing nothing uh, as good as a life exercise. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I guess that's the other thing because a lot of firms are fully invested in terms of developing frameworks, policies, procedures, developing all those things and, and looking forward, running scenarios, running stress tests, running all those things. Whereas I guess now has been the real litmus test in terms of how they stack up both from a financial level, but also in terms of an operational level. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, I agree with that. Yeah. Do, do you think, it's a question I've asked before, do, do you think that buy side firms, which again, historically have, well, the banks got us in trouble in, in, in some cases. Um, so governance was very, very heavy post post financial crisis. On, on the, what I'm tend to find on the buy side is that we're seeing a lot more impetus now going into risk management in compliance. There seems to be that wave has now kind of reached that 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 point. Pemberton clearly are taking risk management seriously. Do, in your experience from talking to your peers out there, is everybody doing that? Well, it's very hard Rob, to talk for the industry as a whole. Uh, I mean, I would like to think so. Uh, throughout my career on the buy side, wherever I worked, I would say. It's yes, but that could also be just a, a, a factor of, of the firms that I was interested in working with. Uh, but if I if I share perhaps some of my experiences at the Gulf International Bank, where I was head of risk management, there I had to sign off on all the credits going into the fund. So it was a very uh, sort of important part of the of the process of making investments mm-hmm. uh, at Kleinwood Benson. Uh, there was quite a rigorous capital management uh, process in place of which I was uh, uh, probably leading that exercise. Uh, We had a very close relationship between risk management and the treasury division that were responsible for the funding element of the bank. Uh, I was a member of the credit committee, uh, decided on credits. I was a member of the asset liability committee. So all of those things had big risk angles to them. At the public investment fund, the same, I was a voting member of the investment committee. So all the investments that that fund made, uh, I was aware of and voted on. Uh, at Pemberton, the same, we, we spent a lot of time on uh, valuations, which I'm integral part of. Uh, I spent huge amounts of time, as I already said, on, on the operational risk side, side of the business. I'm part of the management. I'm a member of the 
board of the AFM in Luxembourg. So, I mean, wherever I've worked, uh, I, I try to ensure that risk management is, is taken seriously. Yeah, uh, and, and and historically, have you seen that the business embraces that? They're part of that. They feel the 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 necessity of working hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, you have to demonstrate that to the firm, I think, Rob. Uh, it's not something that I would say come naturally. So you m have to make a big effort to show the organization that risk is not a policing function, but it actually helps the business. Uh, so throughout my, my career, I, I've put an emphasis on that and I've been at least to some extent successful in, in, in showing that risk management is as part of the organization and we're there to help. Uh, the, there, there is a, a, a governance element from our responsibility for independent reporting to a board, but on a day-to-day -day basis, day -day basis on the ground, we, we, we actually just want to work with the business and help them. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and the three lines of defense model has obviously been sort of the 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 the, the methodology that the firms tend tend to adopt when you're working with these with, with the business and f how do you find that balance then between being involved enough that you're, you're you're at the front line you're at the edge but then at the same time from a regulatory perspective you're impartial enough to make sure that sound decision making is being taken how do you do that uh, i mean i'm quite supportive of the three lines of defense model. I mean, what what I perhaps don't appreciate is sometimes people try to overcomplicate things. There's a big tendency in risk management to to want to sound very smart and and, and, and overcomplicate things because I see like a five lines of defense model, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, if you think about what it's supposed to do, it, it's very simple and the three lines of defense works extremely well in that regard. The, the first line is that the focus there is just to embed a risk aware culture in the organization. You want every person uh, in your organization who makes decisions to consider the downside of, of those decisions. And that's that's what I mean with, with the risk aware culture. Just just think of what can go wrong as well. Uh, this the, the, the second line is, is exactly the uh, a part where it requires the independent oversight because there is uh, a governance or at least a good corporate governance element to risk management where they want somebody independent to confirm that things are going well and that sort of various kind of reporting stuff that you do to risk committees and, and boards and, and these kind of things and that's important to, to do for an organization because it gives the shareholders the comfort uh, to, to, to invest in your, your business uh, and it's also a very important element when you talk to, to investors in your funds. Uh, I mean I spend a lot of my time on due diligence calls with potential LPs uh, that asks these kind of risk management questions. You have to give them the comfort that we do the right thing from a risk management perspective and that that independent oversight exists. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then the third the, the third leg of uh, the three lines of defense is the, the assurance uh, that the audit element needs to give that your control functions works appropriately. Uh, somebody needs to check that risk management is actually working as designed. Uh, and, and that's what the third line of defense is for. Uh, and I guess it's it's going to be that communication across those lines that that again will allow you then to see if it's actually working and it's 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 it's, it's joined up. Correct, right, absolutely. It's, it's it's interesting hearing about how important investors now view risk management if they are seeing if, if they want you to be able to justify fully on those on those calls on those on those meetings. Um, has it always been like that, or is that a, has that been a developing process? Uh, I would say it's been there for quite some time. I mean, it, it comes naturally to an investor to ask what could go wrong. Uh, I mean, it's probably one of the easiest areas to, to talk about because you've got a common alignment and a common interest between your LPs and your risk management department. Uh, and people are by nature, skeptical when they go into a new investment, uh, especially if it's the first vintage in a fund that, uh, or their first in 
investment in your funds. Uh, there is a natural skepticism and our job from a risk management perspective is to provide some comfort and assurance to, to LPs that, listen, we, we are trying to do the right thing uh, and that we are, will be good custodians of your money. Mm. Mm. Yes, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's really because it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, as an investor, I'd I'd be wanting to see how you're operating and your due diligence on that on that myself. Have you done your homework, especially in volatile markets, especially in in, in environments where the, the macroeconomic situation is is not certain? Um, it, it makes it does make a lot of sense because a lot of the time we're talking about internal perspective. You know, a lot of these conversations we have is about internal perspective, but actually it's it's equally, if not more important, that those external partners that you're dealing with. Are, are fully on board with what you're doing as well. Um, third party risk, vendor risk, supplier risk, all of these areas have been extremely busy for us as a recruitment firm supplying to our clients because these are areas that as much as your investors are looking inward, you guys need to look outward as well in terms of what's going on with those companies as we've seen from high profile businesses becoming in trouble recently. So um, it's really interesting to see that that three lines model is still effective um when done properly of course absolutely very interesting what about then from a obviously we mentioned you've worked in in different countries you've seen a different way of working i'm assuming um have you seen stark differences country to country in terms of approach i think to some extent yes rob uh, i think the differences between different type of uh, financial firms is bigger the, the difference between banks and asset managers i think are bigger than what you would see in between two asset managers in different countries okay. having said that uh, i'm also conscious of the fact that it could be from what part of my career I spent in which country that could be influenced just by uh, the, the stage of your career as well. But but my observation that uh, the time that I spent in South Africa, in those days, my risk management experience was very much quantitative based. We've done a lot of sort of uh, interesting mathematical simulations. Uh, I mean, one of the things that, that I'm just thinking about was quite complicated requests once again, coming from from investors, for example, where uh, they wanted to keep the sort of alpha element of an equity investment portfolio relative to a benchmark, but hedge out the sort of beta related risk or the uh, of that. So, and obviously the the amount of derivative tools that we had available in South Africa back then was what limited. So, right. those are the kind of things where the typical portfolio manager gets stuck on. Uh, and then risk management that knows a little bit about simulations and tools can help them. Another interesting example was uh, a case where uh, we had some investors that wanted to take more risk than what the firm provides standard. They tracking error relative to a benchmark was the sort of risk measure that was most uh, considered back then. Uh, and typically old mutual asset managers were running uh, tracking errors of two to three percent. And we had some clients that says, listen, we want like eight uh, percent tracking error relative to a benchmark. And if you look, ask the equity analysts and the portfolio managers, no matter what they did, they 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 got sort of stuck in the sort of four four percent they maxed out. So that's where risk management come in, where we have the we we understand the inter uh, dependencies between assets probably uh, better. We have the the tools to our disposal to to do that simulations. And this was an interesting thing because we we did a very complicated simulation where you took analyst ratings and you brought that into a uh, putting towards a mean return that the analyst provides. So you brought the analyst ratings into a uh, uh, simulation wh where you adjust the mean over time and then you did an optimization exercise off the back of that. So you still brought the, the analyst uh, uh, equity analyst views in, into it and we managed to create some, some really interesting portfolios as a result. So very quantitative in the beginning in South Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I think coming to the UK, uh, I was uh, suddenly very aware of all the regulatory hurdles that needs to be crossed. So right. at least my perspective, 
perspective of the UK, especially in the beginning, was, wow, there's a lot of regulations that I need to get on top of. Uh, so very regulatory focused, I would say, in the UK. Uh, in Europe, I always thought that the risk teams were quite uh, process driven and probably more cautious than what I've seen in Europe. Uh, the Middle East, my experience was that these guys are eager to learn and they always wanted to apply best practice. So it was very much, is, is this the right way to do it? Uh, what's best practice? What 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 are the top guys in the industry doing? Because we want to do it that way. Right. So it sounds like then the main, the main difference from what I'm, as I'm listening to you, it just seems to be how far along that development curve those individual countries are and how mature frameworks and, and and methodology is at that point in time so it's not necessarily a different viewpoint on it it's just how advanced and how how much time has elapsed and how much development has gone into that over the years yeah absolutely it's interesting it's, yeah it's very interesting to hear because you know a lot of the time we certainly from our business perspective we tend to be more focused on let's say the more developed centers your new york your london your 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 paris your luxembourg places like that but actually there is a lot of knowledge required in in those other hubs as well so it's it's, it's quite interesting yeah. you, you were talking about the quantitative side which is obviously a very important part of the whole makeup Data and data analytics that that kind of go alongside those quant disciplines is is again a hot topic for data scientists for those more, more numerical and quantitative disciplines. How important do you think that is going to be in this new era of risk going forward? Well, Rob, I, I always say that uh, probably the number one thing that risk management should do is they should influence uh, the business from a risk perspective. Uh, uh, they should be involved in the planning and decision making of the organization and they need to ensure that th those decisions and the planning all happens within the risk appetite of the business. Now if you go there and you try to do that without the data and the data analytics you're going to go into that room and just provide your opinion. Uh, when you bring data and data analytics into those kind of uh, discussions then you provide real meat to the bone or, uh, and the the conversations are more constructive and the outcomes I think are better. Right and are, and are investors calling for that supporting data when they make their decisions then? Yeah I mean the the data and the data analytics uh, at least in Pemberton I think is, is very much internal focused in terms of the kind of discussions that we have before we we decide on w w whether it's a, a a business related decision for the organization or whether it's an investment related decision that affects the LPs uh, we we try to support all those decisions with, with looking at the right data and, and data analytics and, and due diligence that, that's required for investments a lot of that, however, does make it down to the LPs. We, we're quite transparent and open and, and try to give the best LP uh, uh, reporting that we can. Of course. So a lot of the credit data, for example, that we accumulate through a due diligence of a borrower uh, gets passed on to, to LPs as well. Yeah, fine. So it's, it's that transparency, it's that having access to that data to then make an informed decision off the back of it. Correct. And then the systems and controls around that is, is, is super important because you you can have good intentions and do everything that I say here, but if you can put that then in a in a systematic way, uh, which then obviously have the ability to point out data uh, discrepancies and errors to you through through a process where uh, you have proper sign off of your data or uh, reconciliation exercises. Uh, uh, for example, that you can do between your fund admin, your loan admin and your internal data. All of those things is also super important uh, because you want to make sure that you make your decisions of accurate and good quality data and especially the data that you pass on to your LPs, you want to make 100% sure that that data is of a good quality as well. Yeah, of course. I, I think that that's definitely a challenge that's being picked up from a number of people that I'm speaking to is that is, is finding is getting that good quality data. How do you ensure that the quality is good enough? How do you how do you process that data then? What what do you do with it to in order to make those decisions? How do you then put controls around it, frameworks around it? How can you make it work for you? How can you utilize that commercially 
um, to, to, to make that work for you. Um, so again, it's just interesting. You talked about the three lines of defense and the different departments all working together. We're seeing data being instrumental in risk management, but then in some firms that you know, there is an analytics and data function that sits separately that, that helps provide that data, which is then used for analysis. It's just very interesting to see how and where it sits and then ultimately who has responsibility in terms of in terms of that. So in terms of the new wave of you know, what risk management is going to look like going forward, we've talked about how it's evolved and we'll continue to do so. Um, I think that's definitely going to be a core element of, of it. Is, is there anything else that you think looking down the track? Obviously, we've got new regulations coming up around <clears throat> operational due diligence and, and a con you know, continued development. Is there anything else in particular that you think you might have to embrace, deal with, experience within your function, let's say over the next 12, 24 months? Is there anything else you think might? Yeah, I, I think one thing that's quite topical, uh, actually just this week for, for, for me, uh, and you mentioned before that uh, after the financial crisis, there was a lot of regulation that came to the, uh, especially the sell side of the market. Uh, and there's a lot of regulation coming to the buy side of the market as well. The, the, the UK just, uh, uh, looking into the what they call the investment firm prudential regime uh, and previously where where a lot of firms had to to prepare what they call an icap which is in a, a capital adequacy document internally uh, that has been rolled out to the buy side and we now prepare a document that we call an icara uh, which is internal uh, capital uh, and risk assessment document, uh, which basically going to require a large majority of the buy, fi buy side firms to consider their capital positions as well, uh, which is something that, that Pemberton is in the midst of at the moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So previously, yeah. not many people talked about capital when it came to buy side firms, uh, but uh, the regulator is, is putting a, a specific focus these days on on capital relating to buy side firms and it's an interesting angle that they have because you have to consider the capital that you keep not just based on the risks or the harms as they call it that could come to your firm but you also have to consider your uh, your clients and the risk that could come to your clients and your investors as well as the risk that your firm poses to the market in general so it's a very broad uh, view that the regulator takes when, when it comes to, to risk management and the sort of additional add-on capital that you, you might have to assign to your organization mm -hmm. over and above the, the regulatory capital in the process. So very much the, the, the what we knew about in the banking industry and, and the capital management there, all of that seems to be coming to the buy side as well. So that's that's going to be a bit that's going to be a big theme then this year in terms of, of, of rolling that out. So again, it, it does feel like from country to country we've got different different levels on the curve between buy side and sell side we've got different levels on the curve um it, it certainly sounds like a, a, a an interesting time and and the, this is why i asked the questions about how you you know how you see things change was it the same when you started because i think everybody again everyone i speak to just says the development has been continuous there are new regulations there's new approaches new methodology the financial services is so diverse now in terms of what we look at as an industry we've got fintech platforms we've got you know, a lot more we've got open banking there's so much as part of that which didn't exist then so i guess this capital side seems to be the next thing on the agenda for for firms like like pemberton absolutely Really interesting, really interesting. That's wonderful. Look, Martin, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, really, really great talking to you. Um, I, I think our viewers will agree. It's, it's very interesting hearing your perspective. Very, very interesting on that. Um, so look, thank you all very much for watching. Um, do head over to theriskpartners.com for more information about us and view the other conversations uh, in this series. Martin's obviously from Pemberton. Do go and have a look and see what, what, what the team over there is doing as well. Um, for all those watching, don't forget to share this video with your network. Um, we hope to see you again very soon. So Martin, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Rob. I enjoyed the conversation. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.